working on the 442 today. The goal for today is just going to be to get all the stuff back on the car. So we don't have a big mess laying on the floor before we continue dismantling it. And if we've got time, we're going to do a compression test on this engine. And we're getting ready to take this engine out of it and finish cleaning up the front of the car. We've taken the calipers off and we're draining out the brake system. We're going to send that brake booster in to get rebuilt. We're also going to have the lines off when we clean up the rest of this frame. You'll see why later. These have that cadmium plating. We all already did this once. Trying to get as much oil off as possible. And then we got this shark hide that is just a protective coating that doesn't let it oxidize. These are like cadmium or galvanizing or something so that they don't get any more crud on them. I don't know how much cleaner this is going to happen. If I even steal wool of them, I think I'd take off the galvanizing. I'm starting to wear gloves now because some of the uh, people that watch these shows made comments about not protecting ourselves and it makes sense because everything you end up using goes through your skin and it goes to your liver. Back in the day they, the mechanics used to use gasoline and wash car parts and I remember reading a story one time where a guy was racing NASCAR and he just smashed into the wall. And they didn't know, when they did an autopsy, they thought maybe he was getting carbon monoxide from the cars in front of him or anything. But it turned out he died from lead poisoning, from washing all his car parts with no gloves on. We're going to try this new lock and loop fitting and see how this actually works. So this thing's really nice when it comes to this job, just filling up this automatic greaser. It used to be a job where one person had to hold it together. And even though he's got an air-powered one, you could use it one hand hanging onto it and use the trigger, but it really makes the job a lot nicer. This is another little simple tool that'll make your shop less frustrating. Well, we're getting the PM parts all cleaned up, and this has a little bit of contrast, leaving it with that cadmium coating on it. And from now on, after we work on this thing, any time we work on it, we won't even be getting dirty. It'll be casual working on a car that has no rust, no dirt, grime. It'll be nice to work on. I don't think we've ever had this bearing pack or this full of grease before. Got it right up to the top. So we're going to force all the old grease out of this bearing. And I'll be stepping on it to do that. Well, that's about 200 pounds of force. <laughs> there you have it, one packed bearing. Yeah, so if you're doing this in a shop, you don't have time to waste, you know, using a palm full of grease, yeah, slamming like that. that that's too time consuming. Just cleaned up these calipers. And looks like this one's day coded 1974, so not original. We're at the point of installing our painted parts back on the car. And we've got a new center link, paint black, and new idle arm. And this is the pitman arm. We have this going, and this is parallel. When we ended up driving home and had the stock suspension on, there was this big spacer between the frame and the idler arm. So he's got a manual for a 73 um, cutlass. And we looked at all the pictures and they have the idler arm bolting onto the frame coming outward. So I don't know if the guy had it. Oh no, we looked at the grease and he had it going the same direction, but he had the spacer on there. And I'm thinking if the spacer was on there, these two wouldn't be parallel, but we're leaving this out because ours are parallel already. And if any of you viewers have ever run into this thing with the spacer behind the idler arm, say something about it. On a previous video that we made when we were taking this front suspension apart, we had noticed that there was a strap of steel added on for some reason. Well, we wanted to know what was going on underneath there. If this was an accident or something and he wanted to fix the frame up and make a better patch if he needed it, 
Well, we took it off. There was nothing wrong. And we wanted to make sure, so we had wooden dowels that went through this back bolt, came through, and they intersected exactly in the center. But you'll see how the center link works and this is all engineered out for you already, but if you were ever making some kind of suspension on a vehicle, you see how this is going up and down when you're going over bumps, and this line intersects through those holes. These things have to be at this point for the suspension to go up and down and pivot so you don't have, um, during the travel, steering going on that you don't want. Actually pretty tight. It's grease. You can hear the grease gushing. Inside here there was all serrations. When you put that grease in there it stays inside those grooves. When you get the rubber ones and you put these all together and you turn and stuff, you can see these things gush and move around. These are I mean, they're like solid. Something might end up bending or breaking, really. So I've worked on other cars in the past. Wanted to improve, you know, handling. Went to fatter sway bars. Wanted to use urethane. And the end links, too. Sometimes they break and you get new ones. When you're by yourself and you're on the ground, it's pretty difficult. For him and I, we had it up like this. And... I was trying to get this, and it see, always seems like they don't give you enough thread on the bolts. And he ended up putting a piece of wood through here, and he was prying down on it so I could even just get a thread started. Well, after you get them started, then you look at the bushings really aren't tight against the control arms. By the time you get everything tight, this thing is really torqued up, and it's actually putting a preload on the suspension. So we're going to end up putting this back together and drop it down to see if maybe it pulled the front end down a little bit. So we got these adjustable shocks here. I think it's a competition engineering shock, just rebranded as Summit. But basically what you do is you push it all the way down, and then you start rotating this to hear the loud click. There's two faint clicks. And back to the loud click. Loud clicks 9010 regular. Next faint clicks firm, which is 8020, and the next one's extra firm, which is 6040. So we're gonna throw these in at 9010 and take the sway bar off later on on the car. To mount those shocks, we were actually missing a clip, so we had to get some new ones. Well, there's a little lip in there and she she clicks right up on that control arm. Makes taking the shocks out. In and out easy, which we'll need to do to adjust them. Usually there's one company like Merrimont or whatever that makes all kinds of stuff. Or Cardone. There's, you know, once they're set up, they can make them so cheaply that, you know, you can buy Sears shocks, Gabriel's, all that, and they're just rebranded. In fact, we got some competition engineering adjustable shocks for the back. We'll take them out of the box and see what it says on that body. Competition engineering is written on there. Made in Mexico. I don't believe that's the right shock for the back, is it? On the bottom, there's like an eyelet. And on the top, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a strap with two holes in it. So we'll have to send those back. This is the last stuff in our polyurethane kit. Right. They, they measure it, and it's called durometer. It's the hardness of the material. This is like plastic almost, so it's not going to give. You want everything to be doing input here, not squishing of these. I've been on 4x4 four four trucks where guys had rubber and flown over jumps and stuff, and all of a sudden these just squished out. After cleaning up the undercarriage of the car and redoing the whole front suspension, now we're going to be taking this engine out. But before that, we want to find out why was this thing so doggy. 
It's got a decent ignition and it's got a decent Edelbrock carburetor. And when we would be merging onto the freeways, this thing couldn't get out of its own way. It cruised, got decent gas mileage, but there was no power. So we want to take a compression test on it and we're going to have to take it out. It's, it's cold out right now, but we got to get it up to temperature and then we'll give it every chance it's got, you know, and uh, do a compression test on it, check the voltage at the distributor, find out why it was running so doggy, but then we're pulling the engine out. You're never going to hear this engine again because it's going to be getting a 455. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there. No, it's all hooked up. Lots of pumps. checking for the compression test. We went to go take the spark plugs out. Another limp wristed dude didn't even know how to tighten up the spark plugs. Um, the wires were good but he had one that was damaged where he had pulled it apart. Uh, the MSD wiring was really long and it laid on the exhaust. That was all melted. We got a con concoction of something here. You know, once you use black tape this is, this is ugly. But this is probably not a situation where you lift the hood and show off an engine. There's nothing really to look at. But just in case somebody looked at your work, you wouldn't want that showing up. So now we're going to, we don't want to dive into all this because we don't know if it's going to get involved. So we still want to be able to crank it over. We're going to do the compression test. I'm going to try to keep doing it once. I'm going to go more and see if it goes up higher. All right. One forty. So, after the uh, compression test, you can see we're 140 at a couple of them. The lowest one was 110, and in the manual it says if there's a 70 percent difference, then you'd have to have it rebuilt. But this is within tolerance. They didn't have very much compression on them back in '73, but um, we're still wondering why it didn't have that good of response because he had other vehicles that had the same size engine that it acted a lot more responsive. We're taking the MSD box out here. There's a small red wire to switch 12 volts. I don't know if it matters or not, but they actually had this going to the, they had that going to the resistance wire, so it's probably seen more like 9 volts or something like that. Well, we're ready. We got everything disconnected underneath and above, and we're going to pull this engine out right now. We're not going to use this engine, but I mean, there's a lot of nice stuff on here. This Pro Billet uh, distributor, it's locked for, you know, it's got, you can lock these two out too. And it's got a magnetic trigger. And we got spacer, we got a block off plate. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff on here, I think. As we were lifting this out, this just fell off. It probably didn't knock it apart from power. It just got so oily that the rubber separated, but we didn't even know that it had a bad motor mop because it didn't make enough power to even rock out of its you know settled spot. And as we were lifting this up, all of a sudden, bloop, 
drop down. We didn't find anything really, you know, damaging thing that would have told us why it ran so weak. But when we took the exhaust off, you should have seen the, the exhaust had a bunch of black crap coming out of the pipes. He had the wiring going to a resistor wire, so that might have been giving it a weak spark. That's about all we can say. But otherwise, it's going to keep this engine around in case if anybody wanted the original engine. But I bet you, you'll never use this thing and you'll never sell the car.